AI tools are already in the process of transforming how lots of programmers write code today. It's impressive what these tools can already do, especially if you consider that they're probably still in this stage of the life cycle. If this is what we have today, what will the smartphone version look like? And despite all of these improvements to come, I'm absolutely certain that AI won't fix what I consider the fundamental flaw of programming. We're in a software crisis, by which I mean that we simply don't expect software to work reliably anymore. And I'm definitely not the first person to notice this. In this fascinating talk, Jonathan Blow did an informal experiment where he took a screenshot every time some piece of software had an obvious bug in it. He couldn't keep this up for more than a few days because there were just too many bugs happening all the time to keep track of. I think we've all gotten so used to this general flakiness of software that we don't even notice it anymore. Workarounds like turning it off and on again or force quitting applications have become so ingrained in us that they're almost part of the normal operation of the software. Smartphones are even worse in this regard. I'm often hesitant to do things in the mobile browser, for example, using a government website or uploading my resume to a job board, because things often just don't work on mobile. In the rest of the talk, Jonathan Blow argues that software development as a discipline is in decline. And to fix that, we need to reduce complexity. I agree with him on that, but I don't think all this complexity is being created due to laziness or a lack of discipline on part of most developers. Instead, I think it's because of a fundamental flaw in the way we currently write software, which I believe AI tools will not be able to fix. To understand why, let's first take a look at what these tools are actually good at. Because just to be clear, they are incredibly impressive. Personally, if you had asked me a couple years ago, do you think we will have AI that is this good in our lifetimes? I probably would have said no, much less have predicted the insane development of the last few years. First of all, these tools are surprisingly good at teaching. They're fantastic for getting an overview of an unknown language or a specific technology. For example, I recently had to fix a bug in an unknown web frontend project. I used the cursor IDE, which can scan all files in the code base, and I was quickly able to locate the relevant parts of the code, even letting me jump straight to it. The AI then gave suggestions on how to fix the bug. I'm sure I could have figured this out on my own with some digging through the code and Googling, but I would have been significantly slower. Especially for bigger projects with hundreds of files, this is a game changer. Despite all this, something that I haven't gotten good results with is having AI directly generate code. I think here the output quality really depends on what exactly you're trying to do. For common tasks or boilerplate, it can be good enough, but for anything that isn't super common, I found that it often takes more time to dig through the generated code and fix all the bugs and hallucinations than writing the code from scratch in the first place. This is also why I'm a bit skeptical of all those people claiming that AI made them a 10x programmer or whatever. These hallucinations are clearly AI's biggest flaw, and I'm sure that all the big AI companies are trying their best to get rid of them. I think it's too early to tell if there will still be significant improvements in the models themselves. Just because there was fast progress in the past doesn't mean the rate of progress will remain the same. But I think that even if there are no further breakthroughs for the models at all, the AI tools themselves will continue to improve. One reason for that is that as hardware and algorithms improve, they'll get a lot faster at executing prompts. Sometimes a quantitative improvement, so just cranking up some numbers, can be so significant that it becomes a qualitative improvement as well. For example, we're just starting to see the first AI tools that can control your computer, like Cloud's poorly named computer use. And while this is impressive, it honestly looks clunky and slow as hell. But now imagine this with a model that runs entirely on device and in real time. That may sound impossible at the moment, but remember that in the 90s, we needed days to pre-render a single image like this one. And now we can create images like this one in real time at 60 frames per second. There's only 30 years between those two. I also think that these improvements in speed will unlock completely new and different UX paradigms that we can't even imagine yet today. Right now, the way most people use AI is like this. We open a web browser to give ChatGPT a prompt and get back a result. Note that for each step, we get a different representation of the information, from our prompt in plain English, to the invisible model weights in the AI, to the actual code that is generated. We then manually copy the code and run it through a compiler or interpreter. In this example, that would be the browser with the built-in JavaScript engine. Then we get the running program as the final result. This is pretty tedious, especially if you consider that all the red arrows in this diagram are manual steps. 
in the future, we'll probably have AI agents that continuously prompt themselves until they've reached a goal you've given them. We can already see the beginnings of that with chain of thought models like OpenAI's O1 model. Another obvious way to further improve this process is to automatically feed back the compiler output and errors to the AI model. We could even feed program output, unit test results, or screenshots of the running program back into the AI. This way you could simply write a prompt to generate some unit tests, do a quick check if they make sense, and then have the AI iterate on the code until they all pass. I'm sure there are already people working on this. I think AI will be built into most software by default, for better or worse. But these are only the most immediate, obvious improvements. It's even thinkable that we will integrate AI and compiler, skip the code entirely, and go straight to this. The AI would then be acting as a compiler of sorts, compiling plain English into a working program. At this point, it's hard for me to imagine what programming would even look like in this new paradigm. This all might seem a little far-fetched at this point, but remember that in the 50s, people were actually programming using these relics. It's hard to imagine these days, but people were actually hard coding binary data, literal zeros and ones on these cards. Compilers are so universal now that it's hard to even imagine, but in the beginning there was significant resistance against the usage of compilers too. Grace Hopper, a compiler pioneer, said that initially nobody was interested in her working compiler and that it was difficult to even get anyone to try it. People were worried that using a compiler would result in a loss of control, that the automated process would introduce bugs and performance issues that would take more time to fix than just writing the binary code by hand. Doesn't that sound familiar? Those are exactly the same concerns that I voiced before about AI generating code. And yet, compilers have won over the software industry almost entirely. I'm pretty certain that AI is going to change the way we program even more than it already has, but I think it's still too early to understand how significant the change will really be. But given the recent advances, it's not unthinkable to me that the introduction of AI might be as significant as the introduction of compilers. So at this point, you might be wondering about the title of this video, since so far I've been pretty positive regarding AI, right? Why do I think that AI won't solve the software crisis? To answer this, we need to look at what I consider the most fundamental problem in programming today. Let's briefly go back to the 50s and think about how people programmed before the introduction of compilers. While I'm sure it must have been painfully slow to program in this way, there is one major advantage to this way of programming, full control. If you think about it and look at this diagram, there is no layer of abstraction between your code and the running program. You could say that the code is your program, it's a direct one-to-one -one mapping. When compilers were invented, this immediacy was abandoned and a layer of abstraction was introduced. This is also one reason why people were initially resistant to using compilers. Even though writing code in a high-level programming language is faster than writing low-level code by hand, people were worried it would take away control from them. If the output from the compiler is no longer human readable or it is no longer feasible to work with it directly, some low-level tweaks and optimizations would no longer be possible. And if you truly need such highly optimized code, it could actually be faster to write everything by hand at the lower level of abstraction. Now, you might say, wait a minute, isn't it still possible to go back? Can't we just look at the compiler output and modify it by hand? In theory, sure, it's possible. But in practice, almost nobody does this. It's just too difficult and time consuming to fully understand the generated output. And even if you do manage to modify it by hand, every time you want to make changes to the high level code, you're going to get new compiler output. You would then have to manually migrate your low level changes to the new version. Because of this, you're forced into one layer of abstraction and no longer allowed to touch the other layer without a significant amount of manual work. It's almost like there's a barrier here, which you're not allowed to cross. While possible in theory, it's just not practical. In this sense, because it is possible in theory, just not practical, the loss of control is very subtle. It's almost deceptive. But I think it's super important that we as an industry acknowledge that there actually was a real loss of control. It's like we're forced into one layer of abstraction and if that layer isn't working in our favor, we're screwed. All that said, nowadays we seem to agree for the most part that this loss of control was worth it. Most people don't want to write assembly by hand anymore, with some notable exceptions. People like Mike Acton, Jonathan Blow, and Casey Muratori have long been defenders of starting low level and not relying too much on abstractions. 
They think that the reason why we're faster at writing code is mainly because the industry has collectively decided to just skip this part entirely and ship broken or unoptimized software. While I think there's a kernel of truth in that, I can also see why starting low level isn't an option for most people. It would just take too much effort to do even simple things. Yes, starting low level gives us full control compared to a higher level of abstraction. But very often, the level of quality needed to satisfy a customer just isn't very high. For many use cases, we just don't need highly optimized code. So we can get away with higher level abstractions that give us less control. I think the same thing could happen with AI. Right now, the level of control we have with these tools isn't enough to reach the quality bar, in my opinion. But this could improve in the future. And the result you can get through iteration with AI alone, without digging into the generated code, could still be better than what most people could have produced by hand. Just like most people would not be able to write assembly for complex programs by hand these days. However, I believe we will never achieve the same level of control as when writing programs manually. It's important to note that with each layer of abstraction, there is a new loss of control. There seems to be a general tension between choosing a lower level representation for more control or a higher level representation for ease of use and expressive power. As we keep climbing the ladder of abstraction, we keep losing control more and more. I think a lot of people actually deny that this loss of control even exists. They think that this difficulty will go away if we just find the right abstraction, if we just keep looking hard enough. They think that if we build this tower just one layer higher, we will finally have found the all-encompassing abstraction that covers everything we need. This hunt for the right abstraction seems misguided to me. I see this pattern pop up in programming everywhere, and yet I see very few people talking about it. For example, have you ever used a library or framework and encountered a missing feature or bug in it, but decided it wasn't worth your time digging into the library to fix it? It's the same problem. Let me explain what I mean. Imagine you need to validate some email addresses. You could use a library where you call a function called isEmail. Alternatively, you could also just have written the function yourself or copied it from the library into your project. So one way to view the situation is that the library is taking code written at a higher level of abstraction where you call the imported function and turns it into code written in a lower level of abstraction, which is the function body itself. Now, of course, for such a tiny example, this transformation is super simple and obvious. It's just replacing the function call with the function body. But for more complex frameworks or libraries, it's not as straightforward as copying over a single function. As the library gets more complex, it becomes more and more of a black box. Even if the source code is available, it's often impractical for someone who's just using the library and not actively developing it to fix any bugs. Because digging into the library deep enough to make the necessary changes can become more work than writing the code yourself in the lower level abstraction in the first place. The problem is that the library is usually much more general and has to work for a much larger amount of use cases. Whereas if you just write the low level code directly, you can implement only those bits and pieces that you actually need. So you have to get a lot of value out of the library upfront for it to be worth this trade-off. Here are a few more examples with the same kind of trade-off. Pause the video to read them. In 2002, the founder of Stack Overflow, Joel Spolsky, already pointed out that ultimately all non-trivial abstractions are leaky. And since we keep inventing new ones, as a result, we have this ever-growing pile of leaky abstractions. To me, at this point, the evidence is overwhelming that the entire principle of abstraction, as we're currently applying it, is fundamentally flawed. You know, in the Rust community, people talk about zero-cost abstractions. When they say this, they usually only mean performance. What I'd really like to see is a true zero-cost abstraction, by which I mean that there's no extra cost to our minds. So basically no increase in accidental complexity. How can we accomplish that? What would this even look like? Let me start by saying that while I don't have a complete answer, I've been researching these questions in my spare time for almost a decade now, and I've encountered some very interesting ideas. My main thesis is this. We need to get away from further building out the Tower of Abstractions. Instead, we need to find ways to more easily navigate between different layers of abstraction. How can we accomplish that? Again, I don't have a full answer, but I have a hunch that we're missing an essential constraint, some kind of limitation on our current abstractions. 
We need to find that constraint and then rebuild all abstractions from scratch with that new constraint in place. More concretely, I think we need to rethink the current fundamental building block that we use for abstraction in nearly all programming paradigms. We need to rethink functions. Some of the most promising work I've seen on this is by Jonathan Edwards. I've linked some of his very fascinating talks and papers in the description, and I might even make a video about them in the future. So yeah, because functions are so fundamental, what I'm proposing here is basically tearing everything down and rebuilding all software ever made. Before we do all that rebuilding, of course, we need to be sure that this constraint on abstraction is actually helpful. So what could that missing constraint be? I think it could potentially be reversibility, by which I mean that abstractions should be built in such a way that you can easily navigate the abstraction in both ways. How to do this in practice depends on the specific abstraction. For example, imagine a compiler where at any point in time you can modify either the higher level code or the compiler output directly and both are automatically kept in sync. The only place where I've seen anything even close to this is in UI editors where you can directly modify the UI in a visual editor and it auto updates the code as you do it and the other way around. You have a true bidirectional binding between the two representations. This is non-trivial to do, of course, because the whole point of abstractions is to hide lower level details and work at a new layer of understanding. It's not just a simple one-to-one -one mapping. And just to be clear, I'm not proposing that we should add this functionality to any existing compilers. Instead, I'm asking the question, what would a compiler with this constraint in mind even look like? With the constraint that both representations on both layers of abstraction have to remain editable. The main point I'm trying to make here with this video is that in all these abstractions, both the high level and low level representations have their merit. They're both useful in different situations. We're constantly trying to replace the lower level representations, trying to escape to a higher layer of abstraction, when really what we should be doing is building something that allows us to get the full picture on all layers if needed. Brett Victor explains this much better than I ever could in his article, Up and Down the Ladder of Abstraction. He says that to accomplish this, we need to include interactive explorations into our systems. He gives some fascinating examples for this in his other interactive article, Learnable Programming. Please go read it, it's really fantastic. Throughout my research, I've stumbled upon a whole bunch of interesting programming systems and new languages. I hope to one day bring all these ideas together and come up with something of my own. It's gonna be a while before I got something worth showing here, but if you'd like to see some of the most interesting and unconventional programming environments, languages and paradigms, please let me know for future videos. Coming back to AI, I don't think that it will solve the fundamental issue of programming because it's just another brick on the tower of abstraction, just another black box that we can't look inside. Let me get philosophical for a moment since you've watched this far in the video. I'd like to share with you why I care so much about this. Not too long ago, I watched a BBC video from 1966, where children are asked to talk about the future and imagine what the year 2000 could look like. It's really fascinating, I recommend watching it. Most of the kids they interviewed did not have a very positive outlook on the future. Lots of worry about nuclear war, overpopulation, environmental catastrophes, and so on. I don't think it'll be so nice. But what stood out to me was this boy. I think it'll be, uh, um, people will be regarded more as statistics and as actual people. Apparently I wasn't the only one who noticed this, since this was also the top comment on the video. What struck me was seeing someone else's reply. Yes, the danger of abstraction and potential evil of abstraction. I really believe that the human tendency to oversimplify the desire to have things be simpler than they really are and put the details in a black box is causing a lot of grief and pain to many people. If we can't even figure out how to tame the dangers of abstraction for something as logical and simple as programming, where all the facts are in plain sight, then what chance do we have for real life policies involving complex human emotions? So programming might be the area where we can potentially make progress on this and then maybe transfer it to other disciplines. To me, it seems like a place as good as any to start. Hey, thanks for watching all the way to the end. If you're a returning viewer, watch out for my new channel logo going up soon, made by the wonderful artist Ronil. I've also made good progress on my Git cheat sheet. I release a beta version very soon to all the people on my email list. 
so be sure to subscribe if you want to get it as soon as it's released. Have a great day and thanks for watching Philomatics.